You probably know Alien vs. Predator, but have you heard about Huck Finn vs. The Terminator? It's a 1996 direct-to-print release by controversial author Dan Simmons and a follow-up to Hyperion. And I'm here to talk about it. So let's go. Cheers. Welcome back, everybody, to part three of the downfall of Dan Simmons. And today we're here to talk about Endymion. A third book in the Hyperion Cantos and part one of the Endymion and Rise of Endymion duology, I guess. And while I just called it an action movie, I think that's the best lens to look at it. And that's what we're going to do today. Um, this will be full spoilers, so beware of that. And um, I'll follow it up with Rise of Endymion hopefully next week. All right, so um, my claim is Endymion is basically an action movie and it has all the issues that that beloved genre has, which is it's basically conservative to start with. And it adds onto that the specific issues of being written by Dan Simmons. And um, I'll try to look at it in all of those um, aspects. So let's start with part one, The Heroes. Endymion has a bunch of main characters, and we're going to look at all of those. They are Roland Endymion, our narrator, first-person narrator. Roland Endymion, 27 years old, a shepherd, an outlaw, and extremely well-educated about classics. And we'll come back to that. <laughs> he is unfairly condemned to die, saved by Martin Salinas and um, hired to do one job. Save a 12-year-old kid, flee with her through the galaxy, bring back Earth, <laughs> destroy the church, and talk to the ousters. Seems like a tall order, but Roll absolutely agrees to it, and um, we go there. And that's his role. Enia. A 12-year-old daughter of Braun Lamia and a cybered version of John Keats, characters from the Hyperion Cantos. She fulfills the role of the really annoying, smart, ultra-smart kid that we have to have in every 90s movie. She's basically young John Connor, but a girl, so we can have a really creepy, almost relationship with a dude twice her age. Don't worry, there will be a sequel. Um... She's also to be the coming messiah. Um, we will talk about that in Rise of Endymion as well. And the next one, Abetic. Abetic is an android, and we met him before in Hyperion for like two minutes. And now he will come on that long-ass journey with Rol and Enea to be their well-meaning servant with a different skin color, which is an important role when we have to, you know, go on a boat trip on a raft down a river. Or so I've been told. Father Captain Federico de Soya. He's a Pax captain. That means he's a priest and a spaceship captain in the employ of or in the service of the Catholic Church and its military. He spends his time um, destroying wonderful orbital forests run by the ousters because they're evil and he's good. He does believe from all of his heart and he is asked to pursue and save the child Aeneas and bring her home to the Vatican, where she can be saved. He believes all of that, and throughout this story, he will obviously become aware of certain inconsistencies, question them, and finally succumb to his conscience, and maybe become a good guy in the sequel. We will find out next week. The Marines. Sergeant Gregorius, our token black person, <laughs> Lancer Reddick and Corporal Key are just three marines to provide the military backup that is necessary for every action movie because usually you're financed by the army. Anyway, <clears throat> that's basically our heroes. Time to look at the enemies. A 
fat, rich, ugly, dumb people. This is an action movie, and we have to have basic people to hate, punch, and kill. And these are provided by this stereotype. They're rich outworlders, and they're usually overweight and have very little intelligence, a lot of privileges, and behave like absolute dickheads. <clears throat> they are abundant both on Hyperion and Mare Infinitus and probably other places that we don't go to because that's the two places where we actually meet people. The Catholic Church. Well, the Catholic Church is the Catholic Church in space, and since we left Hyperion at the end of all of Hyperion, 300 years ago, the Catholic Church has embraced the cruciform parasite, has modified it through church magic, or so we believe, so the Deteriorating effects of being resurrected by it are abandoned, and now reborn Christians use it to be immortal. We're not going to look into the technicalities because they're inconsistent and rubbish, but the Church has used that power to rule the galaxy. It is called a new Dark Age, which we are not going to question because Dan Simmons doesn't know what a Dark Age is, and it has suppressed free speech and rules with an iron hand, because we're supposed to hate the church. Obviously, they send out Federico de Soya to find Enia, and um, obviously they have very different goals than saving the girl, um, but we only see a bunch of them being conspirators, being basically the deep state that we had before, but now they're the deep church, so to speak, because religion itself is not wrong. Religion, as portrayed by our good buddy, Father Paul de Ray in Hyperion and Fall of Hyperion was good. It's just Lenar Hoyt who was weak and turned the church into what it is now. Because it is ruled by shadowy entities from beyond the veil that stay behind the throne and with their digital hooked noses and um, side locks. Uh, I mean, the Technocore, our final enemy as always. While we don't see them this time round, it is clear the Technocore is manipulating the church, and at least in this book, we'll come back to that next time round. We don't know how much the church is actually aware of that, how many parts of the church are actually aware of the fact that the Technocore is pulling its strings. Now, we've spoken about this before on this channel, the fact that you have powerful, near-magical, technologically magical in this case, <laughs> entities pulling the strings of organizations to then rule the world is iffy. <laughs> Very iffy. I'll just call it this right now. We're not going to go into that discussion yet. And we have one personification of the Technocore near the end of all of this book, which is our Terminator, or Terminatrix in this case, because the machine is female, and it's called Radamanth Nemesis. We only see her very shortly, um, so more like a Terminator 1 situation here. She gets a I don't know, two or three lines, some of them are really cheap action lines, and um, has a lot of powers. She gets to fight the sp the Shrike, because of course she does. And that's that's our enemies. Sounds like a good set. So let's talk about the plot. And here we are on very firm action movie ground. Cheap action movie ground, but still. It all starts with Rawls' dog getting killed, because every action movie starts like that. You're aware of it, I'm aware of it. Rawl is a guide to rich, fat, ugly, privileged, off-world hunters, and one of them kills Rawl's dog out of spite. When Rawl fights back, punches him in the face, that guy later pulls a gun on Rawl, Rawl defends himself, the guy dies, Rawl gets condemned, he wakes up and has been saved by Martin Salinas, who gives him a speech full of allusions to Joseph Campbell's hero's journey and tells him to you, I already told you, get the girl and flee, find the earth, kill the church, <laughs> find out what the Technocore is doing, meet the ousters, and, you know, be a hero. Roll is like, yeah, sure, I can do that, but please can I have your um, blue-skinned, um, near-human <laughs> servant as a companion? 
and uh, they do exactly that. Rawl flies on that hawking mat. Another callback to the big blockbuster release earlier. Um, comes out of the time tombs, out of one of the time tombs, just as Aenea comes out of another time tomb and saves her because the Shrike is butchering a bunch of people, and that's that. Captain de Soya, in the meantime, has been sent there by the church, is trying to find the girl, barely survives, is saved by the huge black guy, and, well, follows Roll after, you know, a short moment. So we're off on our journey, and uh, Roll and Enya fly the Consul spaceship to Pavadi system, to Renaissance Vector, and then an unknown jungle planet, always pursued by Captain De Soya, who, for one reason or another, does never actually stop them. We're not going to deeply into that. <laughs> then, they end up on an unknown planet with a damaged ship, Rawl, Enya, and Betik, that is, and decide to leave the ship there and build a raft and float down the river. Now we need to talk about that idea, because that's the rest of the plot, right? They're going down the river and the others are following them. We'll, we'll look at those places in a second, um, but yeah, this is the Huck Finn moment. Now, we're, we know that uh, Dan Simmons is huge when it comes to picking up ideas and referencing other works that he thinks are great. Ideally, they're from the Anglophone space. Ideally, they were published somewhere in the 19th century. And Huck Finn, I'm not even going to say he deliberately chose Huck Finn. I think after that spe specific book, writing any story that is about like traveling down a river will always be connected to Huck Finn. There's interestingly enough another book that came out at the same time, roughly the same time, 1996, 1997, which is parts of the Otherland uh, Tetralogy, um, Tetra, whatever, Tetralogy um, uh, by Tad Williams, which features a long trip along rivers, uh, well, a river from world to world. Um, Maybe that's a rant for a different day. Basically, I just wanted to point out that here, with the raft, with Bedic being different skinned and from a group of people that was forced to serve humanity, um, or other humans, yeah, it, it has that, <clears throat> that Huck Finn ring to it. Now the question is, do you really want to go and do that? Do you really want to write Huck Finn in space? Because it, that leaves you open to a lot of questions about stuff like race and slavery. And do you really want to do that? Apparently Dan Simmons wanted to. We'll come back to how badly he fucks it up um, later on. So don't worry. So from here on out, the plot is fairly simple. They move from world to world, have adventures on those worlds. And sometimes De Soya and his gang, which is those three marines and... Um, Later on, two of them, plus uh, Radamanth Nemis, pop into those space situations, uh, those different um, star systems, and uh, follow them all the way, getting closer, all the way to that final showdown on God's Grove. And, yeah, that's where we have the final battle, where um, De Soya and Riddick, um, not Riddick, yeah, Riddick, or is it key? It's key. Anyway, De Soya and one of the surviving m marines um, save Rawl, Aenea, and Bedic, and then leave. Rawl, Aenea, and Bedic move through the final forecaster onto Old Earth, which is just Earth and not just Old Earth, and um, hang out in Falling Waters, built by Andrew Lloyd Wright, uh, Lloyd Wright because we'll find out next week. Anyway, that's the rough plot. Adventures on the way there is where we need to go now because I think each of those has those locations does something more or less interesting. The most important one is the adventure on Sol Draconi Septum, which is um, Ice World. And we'll come back to that later as well because, oh boy. All right. The first planet is a jungle planet, and there's nothing there to do but to build a raft and float down the river and move through the Farcaster portals, which, for an undisclosed reason, work for Enya because she has special connections to um, the good AIs, which are not the Technocore AIs, and we'll find out about that possibly, maybe, at some point in the future. We don't know. <laughs> anyway, 
They go through, they show up in Mare Infinitus, they um, sail along Mare Infinitus, they come to a sea portal there, a, a sea platform where fat, ugly, privileged, uh, outworld fishermen are um, hunting big game because that's apparently what you do during the Dark Ages. Rol ends up in a bit of a tussle with them, gets saved by Aenea, and they move on to the next place, which is Hebron. A bit later, um, Father de Soya and his gang show up on Mare Infinitus. They discover that there's been a lot of corruption on the ground. De Soya does the right thing, gets punished for it later, because obviously the entire structure is corrupt. We know that structures are always corrupt, because structures are bad. Um, we'll talk about it later. Don't worry. Uh, Hebron is, well, apparently empty because all the Jews have been moved away, which is something that Dan Simmons is oddly focused about. Let's just put a pin in here. We'll, we'll come back to the Jewish question. Dan Simmons and the Jewish question in, you know, a book of three. Just put a pin in there. Apparently the Jews have been, have all vanished and, um... Rawl gets um, patched up in a local hospital, and they move on to the next planet, which is Solteraconi Septum. Solteraconi Septum is an ice world, and they have to leave their raft behind, meet some local natives, which are the Chichatuk? Chichatuk? Um, all right, the name is already bad. The Chichatuk, they are living from the one, like, hunting huntable animal the arctic wraith they take everything from them they are broad faced they're really nice underneath and they help them and we also meet a um priest don't ask about the priest there's so much inconsistency there because at this point dan simmons just really doesn't care anymore i feel but he's a good priest. He's a good guy, because we need to make clear that religion itself and being a priest is not wrong. It's the corrupted part that is run by the Technocore that's evil. Anyway, they hang out with that guy. He's called Father Glaucus, which is a reference to Endymion, the poem where um, a shepherd, um, Endymion, um, runs through the underworld and in the underworld finds a Glaucus of the great god and, you know, we need to have our classics references here. <laughs> I already said that. Anyway, they move on. Um, Radamanth Nemes at this point and the gang of Father de Soya show up. Radamanth Nemes, while the rest is still somewhat in, in frozen sleep, and we'll talk about the resurrection crap in a moment, um, goes down, murders everyone, finds out where they're going next, and decides um, to, yeah, go there. So, before we come to God's growth, I guess I need to talk about um, the Radamanth Nemes and resurrection thing. All right, see. <clears throat> this, <laughs> the force, um, the space force, uh, the PAX, has these super fast spaceships where people die because of resurrection, uh, be because of like using some weird um, wormhole technology, and then they get resurrected through those cruciforms. Now, Radamanth Nemes, being the Terminatrix, doesn't have to die and resurrect because she's a machine. It's a machine. Whatever. Um, so... She has time to do all these things while the other guys are still resurrecting. They then... Um, <laughs> but before they leave again, Father de Soya finds out that something was amiss and he's suspicious of the machine. He's been hedging some doubts about, like, hunting a girl through the galaxy might be morally wrong if he's taking his, like, vows as a priest all, you know, seriously and stuff. But now he's, like, even more suspicious and he tricks her so when the next time they move to a different planet, which in this case will be God's Grove, which she found out, and, you know, never mind. He'll, arrive, he'll wake much earlier than planned, and that's what happens. They wake up, they find out Radamanth Nemes, the Terminatrix, has left the spaceship and is already on the planet. On the planet, Nemes has built... A, we're not talking about the name Nemes and Nemesis because, yeah, this is a smart joke by someone who thinks he's smart and has to make sure that we also know he's smart. Um, has built, like, an ambush for... Um, the the ship, to kill Aenea, take her head home to the Technocore, and uh, we get her perspective there, so we know that she's from the Technocore, and we know that she's evil, and all of that stuff, and she's very, very technologically advanced, so when the Shrike, and we'll talk about the Shrike in a moment, um, shows up, randomly, she can kill the Shrike, or at least trap the Shrike, um, because maybe that's something she wants to do. 
In the meantime, the rest of the gang uh, come through the portal after having stopped on Qum Riyadh, which is a um, Islamic planet with really strong connections to um, Iran um, and not so much to um, Sunni places, but more like Shiite places. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. We go there, uh, they go there to patch up Enea, who this time has some form of sickness, and then they come through God's Grove, and there ensues a huge battle, uh, which is witnessed by um, Captain De Soya and Key from the spaceship, and they, um, well, they use their lasers or whatever it is, their weapons to melt the ground, and Radamanth Nemes is, uh, you know, swallowed up by the lava, and the kid and Roll and a wounded Bedek flee with the dropship um, and move on to Earth, which is where the story ends. The Soya is like, yeah, I trust you, I wish I could come with you, but I can't, I'll just go home and be the good, honest priest and confess everything and we'll see what happens, and maybe I'll see you next time round. The end. Now, there's a lot of prom problems here, and we'll, we need to talk about all of those. See, the action movie itself is a very conservative um, medium, right? It's all about individuals fighting a corrupt system. That's basically what it is. It's... It, Basically, action movies are the justification for lynching. That's basically how action movies work these days, and this book is sort of the same thing. We have our our outsider, individual, loner, Roll and Dimion, fighting the system, fighting the church, which is corrupt, but because religion itself and faith is kind of good, we need to make sure they're manipulated by someone else, which is, I don't know, iffy. Uh, uh, yeah, it's structural anti-Semitism, and I know Dan Simmons will deny that because he loves the Jews. Stay tuned for Dan Simmons and the Jewish Question in a couple of videos. The Shrike. It shows up whenever it is convenient to have some slaughter and some action scenes. As I said, this is written by an action movie. We even have the really dumb jokes uh, that are in important for these kind of action scenes. When, like, any of the soldiers is swearing, Father de Soya is always, I am your priest, but as a soldier, I, I'm a, I agree, go kill those motherfuckers. Yeah. It's dumb. It's cheap. It, it, it reads like one of those like late night action movies that you really don't want to watch anymore because you're hopefully no longer 15. Um, <clears throat> we follow all of that. Um, as I said, the cheap idea that like any form of like <clears throat> evil is, is designed by, you know, I said it, being fat, ugly, and out of world. Those evil elites that we need to hate while secretly loving them is the first thing. To, you know, signify that by having them being overweight is bad, but once again, conservative media does that. Action movies did it for a long time. The bad guys look bad, and the bad guys are evil. We've seen that before. It shows up everywhere. Read Wheel of Time. Every bad person has some visual features that are bad. Uh, or are designed as, you know, they're unappealing because they're evil. We have that part. It's just annoying because it's so cheap. But there's greater problems here. Um, let's talk about free speech and self-aggrandizement by Dan Simmons. See, Martin Salinas' Hyperion Cantos, which is written by Dan Simmons, and there are quotes in there which are, you know, quotes from the, the earlier books, is an artifact in this world the Cantos. And it has been banned because it speaks the truth. Um, so it has been banned, but everyone is also reading it at the same time. And the number of times the book Hyperion gets mentioned, it's bad. It's Dan Simmons is like, hey, I spoke the truth there and everyone doesn't want to know it. So let me jerk on it some more in my next book and mention how there is the truth in there and people are unappreciative of it. But it's a huge underground hit because, you know, it was a science fiction novel that did not actually garner all the mainstream success that he maybe hoped for. I'm just saying this is nothing, you know, I'm not attributing any, like, grand design to Dan Simmons here. I'm just saying these are, like, symptoms of something that we will come back to. The, the idea that the artist feels underappreciated or unappreciated for something that they tried to do with their former book so they make sure you get it here. The idea that 
you know, every book by virtue of being banned speaks the truth is something that um, is highly suspicious, especially when it comes from people who do really love to ban, you know, stuff like mouse or what have you, you know. We're not going into it here as well. It will come up later uh, again. But it, we see first glimmerings of those ideas of how freedom of speech works or does not work. How, you know, the truth will always be suppressed by the system. and How, you know, these outsiders. It is combined with once more the love for 19th century art, which is absolutely ridiculous. Roland Dimion is a shepherd who lived with a gang of other, uh, you know, shepherds and other people on the moors. He decides not to become part of the church. He has never studied or anything. But luckily, his grandmother, who is called Grandam for some reason, um, loved playing Rachmaninoff on a piano that they had on one of their um, carts when they drove through the moors. Makes sense, right? He knows a lot of literature. He knows a lot of art. And we're like, I know what you're doing, Dan Simmons, but this is the year 2021. How many of you, dear readers, have heard Rachmaninoff and can recognize uh, Rachmaninoff? Uh, Joanna, if you're watching, you don't count. <laughs> Seriously, I, I don't know. It, it just drives me livid that this is sort of the ideas like our simple out, you know, outlaw, but he knows what I, Dan Simmons, consider to be high art, which is Mozart, Rachmaninoff, um, 19th century poetry, and um, apparently a Wizard of Oz, because it always is. It, it's just annoying because it's, it feels so unsubtle. It's like, hey, this is the stuff you need to think of as good. Now ram it down your throat in every moment. And it it, it is even more heavy-handed in Endymion than it is in Hyperion and Fall of Hyperion. It just annoys me a lot. But once again, this is this is small fry compared to like the big issues. The big issues are, as I said, structures are corrupt. Unless they're the military, the military is always good because it's about duty and honor and obedience. And people do that and it works. It's not corrupted. The people that give them orders are bad and evil and corrupted. But the military itself is great. Now, if this were a ma <laughs> if this were an action movie, it would probably have been funded by the Pentagon. But it isn't. It's just a novel that kind of takes those ideas because they are deeply ingrained in conservative mindset. Armies are good. Embody that warrior ethos, sacrifice, duty, honor, obedience, and, well, a freedom from consequence, because it's the people that give them their orders that are to blame. And they are portrayed in a respective way in this book, right? It's the church. They're all corrupt and <laughs> cartoonishly villainous in, 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 in cheesy ways. So there's there's that part. But beyond, you know, that whole, like, idolizing of the military, there's a way bigger issue with this book, and that is racism and exoticism. That's what we're here to talk about for now. Because, see, um, there are two elements here. One of them is the android situation. Um, I already mentioned that it's sort of built on, like, Huck Finn, and of course with Huck Finn we have Jim, the escaped slave, and that discourse. I'm not going to discuss uh, Huck Finn here. That's not my job, and I'm not qualified to do so. I'm not even qualified to talk about that element of racism and slavery in any way, you know. But we have androids, which in this world of the un um, version of the universe um, are... Humans that are genetically manufactured, so they're much closer to the replicants or androids of... Um, do androids dream of electric sheep than, for example, um, you know, an android like Data in Star Trek? They are built with or bred and constructed to serve humanity. They have blue skin, so we can always find out who's, a, who's an android and who's a human. And... Even though some of them are free, they are still very much subservient, which is exactly what happens with a Bedic. And there's an issue here, because, yeah, that's slavery, what happened there. And having them distinct, but also basically human, just maybe a bit stronger or whatever. Yeah, 
opens you up to all of those questions. And what happens in this book is that a that a medic, because a is like you know the honorific or not honorific for androids here, is and remains subservient in every attempt, well, the few attempts to, you know, just um, see him as an, and treat him as an equal by Roll, are, well, rebuffed by him, and then, well, Roll decides to not be an egalitarian ass about it and let poor Bedig remain subservient. And that's a pretty, I don't know, cheap way to deal with it. It's like, yeah, he's free, but he still wants to do that. It opens you up to that whole, like, Aristotelian model of slavery, where you go, like, yeah, you know, it's in the nature of some people to be subservient, so we should actually let them be that way, because that makes them happy. And that, that sucks. I'm just saying that sucks. For an alternative, you can see on the treatment of a similar situation in The Wind-Up Girl by Paolo Bajigalupi, right? He goes and has the wind-up girl's genetics modified with something that makes her more subservient. And as a rational person, she really, really, really hates that. Understandably. Now, <clears throat> that conditioning that is built into her as well. She really, really hates that. Now, we obviously don't get Betik's perspective. He's just humble and nice. And while he may hint at the fact that it's not really cool, he's also like, yeah, nothing can be done about it. I guess I'm fine with it. Nah. And that's that's where I think something problematic comes in, because it's basically you're setting up an issue that current politics still have to deal with, especially in America. The idea is like, how do we deal with the fact that we did something terrible in the past? Because androids are no longer fa manufactured in this world either. So how do we deal with something like that in the present? In this case, in the present, the book is like, well, I guess we can't actually fix it. We'll just be kind to them, but still treat them as other. And that's that. It's like, are you sure that's the way you want to go with this? Because... Why build that in unless you want to make said point about it and then you just don't explore it any further? Now, I know Bedic will have a bit of a more of a role in the next one. We'll come back to him. I just wanted to point that out because, well, having him along the ride on the raft just opens you up to that criticism. And that's just, I don't know, not cool. And just shows what kind of you know, viewpoint someone like Dan Simmons. It's a very conservative point. It's like, yeah, racism's over, slavery's over, I guess we're done. And that's obviously not the case. It, yeah. Let's go to the exoticism. The Chichitook. Look at the name. They are dressed in white furs and they hunt and that's all they do. They are the worst possible cliche of what I guess the correct term right nowadays is Inuit. I hope I do, don't offend anyone with that. Uh, of Inuit, how they are perceived and exoticized. And that's just really bad because all they do is, you know, be kind, exotic primitives that help the people, uh, help our heroes for a while and then get slaughtered afterwards. And I guess we're to moan for them, where I guess we're to mourn for uh, them in a way and feel bad for them. But, but the picture is like all the cliches that anyone outside, like reality, actual real life, has of those people, you know, the terrible Christmas cards from early on, people living in igloos and all of that. All of those exotic stereotypes are just ported into space and then just paraded for our amusement there. And that just is not very good. And I, th I would argue there's a deeper reason behind that. See, the point with this entire world that Dan Simon has built here is exactly that. He has taken a lot of stuff from our world, or the way he sees our world, and just transported it like 3,000 years, um, no, 1,000 years into the future. And things just stay the same. People listen to the same music. People still have the same culture. They even refer to revert to something more traditional if you let them. Uh, they live in their own cultures away from everyone else and we can just like travel through that as hero with our heroes and see you know them being the way we imagine them to be. It, it has that feeling of like l late 19th, early 20th century human zoos almost in a way and yeah, that's just not very cool. 
Now, I, I, I think Dan Sims didn't actually do any of that on purpose. I just wanted to point these elements out because I think they show that underlying conservatives... I, I got my studies sort of right, so how can anyone complain mindset that is very much underneath this, all of this? with having our poet, our stand-in for Dan Simmons here being uh, Martin Salinas, of never caring about who he insults in the name of freedom, art, and uh, truth, which, yeah, does not age well. Once again, just put a pin in it, we will come back to it later on. So where does it leave us with Endymion as basically the novelization of an action movie? Well, it basically is very insensitive to just about everything, has elaborate battle, combat, and chase sequences, really cheap effects. The Shrike always shows up when we kind of expect it to show up, and then everyone is surprised that the Shrike is there and kills a bunch of people and then just vanishes again. We have the cheap soldier humor, but the soldiers are essentially the good guys. Our characters have very little time to actually evolve as characters. Um, they're sort of stand-ins to pass through that world to get the message that civil authorities, and we'll just call the church uh, civil authority here, are kind of bad, get corrupted by very powerful beings that work in the shadows, and individual humans, individual heroes have to stand up against that system and solve those complex problems. That's very conservative. That's also very uh, proto-fascist, just saying. Once again, there's no direct political agenda here, not in a way that we'll see it in flashback, but there is already, you know, the seeds are here, and that's sort of my point here. Now, I know a lot of people don't like Endymion that much, and I can see why the, the, the narrowing down of the plot makes it look less fun. Um, Dan Sim spends an inordinate amount of time to use his, well, considerable um, skills at composing prose to just describe things in way more detail and nuance than he did in the previous books, which you can either find really interesting or really, really boring, depending on what you want to do. But it, it feels like a departure or an, it, a narrowing down of what we got in, Imper in Hyperion and the Fall of Hyperion. It is more shallow. It's more surface. It is, as I said, <laughs> a direct-to-print uh, sequel. It is very much a 90s action movie with all the bad bits in there and because it's a book the fireworks don't look as good so there we are i'll continue with rise of endymion next week um if you made it this far thank you very much uh, for watching uh, please like subscribe share tell me all you want to say about it in the comments and i don't know maybe support the patreon i would really appreciate that thanks to everyone who does already do that i, I do really appreciate it anyway uh, thanks for your patience and i'll see you in the next one cheers